Well, th thank you very much for coming today. I particularly appreciate the fact that you're here on what is a Friday afternoon and what I've been told is the nicest day so far this winter. So uh, to see everyone here is, is very nice. I appreciate that. So um, uh, thank you, Mark, for that introduction. My, my name is Dan Molson. Um, I appreciate everyone for coming and for the university for inviting me. My talk today is going to be on uh, the application of semi-definite optimization techniques to problems in electric power systems. So I'm going to get into a little bit more of what that means in just a second. So the big idea is that engineers use optimization techniques to design and operate electric power systems. Optimization is one of the main tools in our toolbox that allows us to you know, run these, these power systems. Now there's been some recent advances in optimization that I'll be you know, using today that provide new avenues for improving power system economics and reliability. Those are two things that we're always very concerned about in electric power systems is you know, how much do things cost and let's keep them running. And uh, we'll be exploring the application of a, a type of optimization called semi-definite optimization, semi-definite programming, and we'll be looking at the power flow equations. I'll be getting more into those in a few minutes. So first I'd like to provide some background in electric power systems to kind of get everyone up to speed. So typically, we'll divide electric power system work into three areas. There's uh, the generation of electricity. This is where we actually convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. These are your you know, coal plants, your wind turbines, your natural gas facilities. Uh, once the energy is you know, converted to electrical form, we step it up in voltage and we push it onto a transmission system. And this is an intercontinental scale transmission system that we have in the United States. You can see here some of the lines in America. These are really just the uh, high voltage lines. There's, this is kind of the, the backbone of the system, I guess you would say. Finally, once we send it through the transmission grid, it reaches a substation where we step it down in voltage and send it into the distribution network. And uh, from the distribution network, that's you know, where the end user actually uh, consumes the electricity. That's your house or industry or, or wherever. So in the United States, we actually have three electrically separate interconnections. So these you know, all operate at 60 hertz, but they're not uh, electrically, you know, synchronously connected. There might be some DC connections between them, but primarily they're, they're quite separate. We have uh, where I'm from, the Eastern Interconnect. Uh, then there's the Western Interconnect, where we are right now. And uh, Texas, of course, does its own thing. And there's the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, or ERCOT. And you, know, you laugh about that, but the, the primary reason that they're separate is that uh, it's no longer interstate commerce if it's only within Texas. And the federal government has far less authority over what goes on there. So there's a, a practical reason for that, although it causes some challenges of their own. Within each interconnection, certain parts of the country are under a wholesale electricity market. So where I'm from in the Midwest, we have what's called MISO, the, the Midwest Independent System Operator. They run the electric system, they run the electricity markets, so every utility participates in this market to buy and sell power. Uh, but there's electricity markets, uh, primarily in the East, uh, are they more common, uh, but there's you know, the most uh, possibly infamous one is uh, the California ISO, uh, which you probably heard about in the early 2000s. So the key point here is we have these really large scale uh, problems we're trying to solve. We're trying to solve optimizing the, uh, the generation over regions of potentially several states. So this is a, these are big problems we're interested in. And even in the regions like here in Utah where there's not an electricity market, many of these same problems need to be solved. Um, perhaps not quite to the same scale, but still to very large scale. So what we've seen over the years is an uh, amount of increasing interconnectivity of the network. So both in terms of uh, electricity markets, uh, where in the past we, we really had each utility that kind of had its own system, provided generation for its own load. You know, each utility kind of did its own thing, maybe bought and sold some power from its neighbors, but was kind of isolated. Over the last 15 or so years, we've had, as we've seen, increasing amounts of electricity markets where people are trying to buy and sell power over you know, fairly vast geographic distances. And what we've seen projected into the future is even more interconnectedness. So here is a proposal to take wind power from the, the central the country, center of the country and distribute it towards the, the Great Plains. So these are all proposed 765 kV lines. This is the highest voltage line that uh, is used in the United States. This would be a 
truly massive expansion of our transmission system. Uh, there's obviously many challenges to doing this. This is not something that I suggest will happen tomorrow, but these sort of proposals are becoming more common. Now to give uh, some measures of the economic importance of electric power systems, one measure you can look at is the, just the industry size. So in, in 2010, the electric industry had revenues of $369 billion. So clearly this is a truly large industry. And reliability is incredibly important. So uh, some, one study has pegged the uh, annual cost of power interruptions at $79 billion. So this is, you know, you, know, you lose a, uh, say for instance, power to a chip fabrication plant and you've just lost a lot of money right there, but also just other sorts of, of interruptions can be very problematic. And we can see the uh, incidence of, of some large scale blackouts. So here is the skyline of New York City in 2000, August 2003. Um, the lights are on. That's because the entire Northeast was blacked out then, it affected 50 million people, and was estimated to cost between four and $10 billion. So these are the sort of things we would really like to avoid. So this increasing interconnectivity I've talked about provides both opportunities and challenges. So opportunities in the sense that we can reduce the system operating cost. With, with larger uh, or more integrated systems, we can transmit power over larger distances, we can use our system more effectively. So as one measure of that, we can say there's a study that showed that a 1% savings in uh, our, our dispatch uh, cost would be worth one to four billion dollars annually. So even small improvements can make large impacts. And we see that the potential savings grow as we increasingly make the system more and more interconnected. But there's challenges associated with this as well. So for instance, as we make the system more interconnected, local problems can more easily propagate to regional problems or potentially you know, continental scale problems. And we see potentially increased probability of blackouts. So as one measure of that, in the East, they have a procedure they call a transmission loading relief, a TLR request. And this is where the grid operators have to take some sort of extraordinary action to uh, you know, make sure, rebalance the system, make sure that the system doesn't go unstable. And we see that over time, as the uh, markets have become more common, as the systems have become more integrated, these extraordinary requ requests have, you know, substantially increased. So this is where optimization can, can come in and, and help us. So uh, new advanced optimization techniques have applications in power systems engineering. What we're going to be talking about today is something called a semi-definite programming relaxation of the power flow equation. So this work originally came out of some guys at uh, Caltech that have done this, and we've been trying to leverage it to a whole bunch of problems in, in power systems. What we'll be looking at are the power flow equations. So these are the equations that relate the power injections in a transmission network to the voltage phasers in the transmission network. So the voltage magnitudes and angles everywhere related to the, the power injections, the active and reactive power injections. We're gonna be applying it to problems in economics and that the problem we'll be looking at is called the optimal power flow problem. And in reliability, where we're interested in when do these power flow equations uh, have a solution? You know, how can we, be, um, be see, can we see when there's not a solution to these equations? Because that means we've blacked out our system. And we're also interested in voltage stability margins. And this is to say, you know, if we have a solution, how close are we to not having a solution? In other words, how close are we to a reliability blackout, a reliability problem of blackout? So I'm gonna uh, provide an introduction to some of these topics. Then I'll look at uh, the application of semi-definite programming to the optimal power flow problem, and then explore some of the things we've done to look at large scale problems, uh, large scale optimal power flow problems. And then we'll transition to some reliability topics, and I'll discuss the sufficient condition we developed for power flow insolvability. So in other words, when this condition is satisfied, the power flow equations are guaranteed to not have a solution. And we'll show some applications to voltage stability margins. So first I'd like to just get some basics of optimization down so we're on the same page. So first I'd like to describe, uh, you know, here if we, one important concept in optimization is, is convexity. So if you, everything works nicely if we have convex functions, we can find uh, truly global optima. So if we're trying to minimize some function, we see here this function is convex, and uh, it's, it's fairly easy with, or existing techniques can find truly the best solution, the, the true minimum to that function. However, when we start dealing with non-convex functions, they might have what are called local optima. So here is a point where you know, it's, it's locally the best solution in a small neighborhood around that point, but it's not truly the globally best solution, we can get a minimum down there instead, that's, that's even better. 
So uh, non-convex functions, it's hard to find the, the global optimum. A little bit more terminology. What I'll be talking about is a relaxation. So what do I mean when I say relaxation? If we have a, a convex relaxation, uh, what we do is it's a function that lower bounds our initial function. And what we're hoping for is that this relaxation is tight at the global optimum. So you can see here our function, we've got a local optimum there. Our original function has a global optimum there. And this black line might be some relaxation that we would introduce. It, it lower bounds our original function. And, uh, but we see here that the uh, global solution, or the solution to this relaxation is not the same as the global solution to our original function. So this relaxation is, is not tight. In other words, we, we say that it has a non-zero duality gap. Conversely, if we have a tight convex relaxation, we see here that our, this is perhaps another relaxation we might use, where this function, again, lower bounds the original function, but it's tight at the global optimum. The, the minimum point of this black function is the same as the minimum point of our original blue function. So this is what we, we would like in a relaxation. We say it has zero duality gap. So next I'd like to get into some discussion about the, the power system stuff. So I'll be talking about the power flow equations. As I mentioned, these are the equations that represent or that uh, relate the power injections in a system with the voltages in a system. So we split our transmission grid into three different types of buses or nodes on, on the network. The first is called a PQ bus. This is typically used to represent loads. And at these buses, we specify the active power P, or you might hear the real power P, and the reactive power Q. And we use the power flow equations to calculate the voltage phase, or V, in, in delta. We also have PV buses, which we use to typically uh, represent generators. Here we specify the active power P and the voltage magnitude V. And from the power flow equations, we calculate the reactive power Q and the voltage angle delta. Finally, we have a, a single slack bus, or reference bus. And this is where we enforce conservation of energy. We need to make sure we are uh, energy in equals energy out. And so here we specify the voltage magnitude V and we set a reference angle of delta equal to zero. And we calculate the active and reactive power injection. So if you've seen the power flow equations before, this form here is probably what you have seen them in. They're the polar voltage coordinates. So we write our voltages as a magnitude and an angle uh, with, the, with that form there. And we see that the power flow equations can be represented in terms of these trigonometric functions, cosines and sines. This is more common. However, an equally valid representation, one that we'll be using, is uh, writing the voltages in terms of rectangular coordinates. So we have a voltage uh, that's represented with a real part, VD, and an imaginary part, VQ. When we write the voltages in this form, we see that the power flow equations can be represented as coupled quadratic equations. So these are polynomial equations, which isn't obvious when we have these trigonometric functions. But writing in this form, we see that they're, they're really coupled uh, quadratic equations. So as uh, th these powerful equations represent the sinusoidal steady state equilibrium. So we're not looking at dynamics right now. We're looking at, uh, at the steady state equilibrium point for a given dispatch. As I mentioned, they're nonlinear. They have this coupled quadratic form. And traditional techniques for solving these use locally convergent uh, methods that are dependent on an initial guess. So you take a guess at the uh, voltages at the solution. And you use some sort of iteration scheme to try to minimize or to try to um, solve those problems. So typical techniques are newton raphson and Gauss-Seidel if you've done some numerical analysis. Um, but it's important to note here that the failure of this method to converge doesn't mean that the powerful equations don't have a solution. Perhaps you just chose a bad initial guess. So next we move into the optimal power flow problem. So here's where we actually introduce an optimization problem. What we'd like to do is determine how to operate our system. What is the generator dispatch? How much are we going to ask each generator to produce? Uh, so the, what this problem does is it tries to minimize a cost, typically the cost to generate power, uh, while satisfying both physical laws and engineering constraints. The physical laws are the power flow equations. The engineering constraints are making sure we don't melt our transmission lines. And the outputs of this uh, problem are generator dispatches, line flows, potential control actions, those sort of things. The problems we're interested in have very large scale. As I mentioned, we might optimize the dispatch over a region of several states. And so we're talking, and numerically, maybe 10 to the fifth buses 
or ten, and 10 to the fifth transmission constraints. So these are, are fairly large scale problems. They're in general non-convex and NP hard, so they're, as I mentioned, difficult to solve these. And they've been, this problem has been studied for 40 years. This is you know, one of the important problems in electric power systems, but none of the existing methods guarantee that you achieve a global optimum. So now enter semi-definite programming. You know, this has been a technique that's been developed about you know, 10 or 15 years ago. It's slowly been making its way through different fields, and it's finally made its way to power systems. So semi-definite programming is a type of convex optimization, and since it's convex, we can find the global optimum solution to, this, to these semi-definite programs. What we do is uh, we have variables that are matrices now. So this W matrix here is our unknown in this optimization problem. We're optimizing a matrix where these B and A matrices and this, this constant here, those are specified values. So B is a specified matrix, A is a specified matrix. And uh, you can recall that the trace operation, if you have the trace of the multiplication of two matrices, it's kind of like dot producting those two matrices together. You know, if you dot product two, vec uh, two vectors together, you just multiply the corresponding elements and add them together. It's kind of the same thing for uh, the trace of a matrix multiplication. Where, so this is linear, and that's linear. Uh, where the nonlinearity comes in is that we constrain this matrix variable to be positive semi-definite. What does positive semi-definite mean? It means that all the eigenvalues are, are strictly uh, non-negative. You know, it's semi-definite, so it could be zero, but they're all um, non-negative. So hopefully I didn't throw too much linear algebra at you. The idea here is we have this, uh, this new optimization formulation that allows us to do some cool things. So how do we apply this to powerful equations? What we do is, uh, it turns out we can write the powerful equations in this form. This is a quadratic form uh, with a matrix variable AI in the middle. This is, um, you know, can be defined for each of the types of equations if you're interested, active power, reactive power, voltage magnitude. And uh, if we write the voltage components, the VDs and VQs, the real and imaginary parts of the voltages into a vector here, we can write all the power flow equations in this form. No relaxation yet, that's, you know, the power, it's the exact. Then we define this matrix W equal to be, if this is the vector X of the voltage components as X, X transpose. So this matrix W is a, a rank one matrix. Uh, so in other words, it has one non-zero eigenvalue. And uh, this allows us to rewrite these equations, the power flow equations in this form, into this trace form. So you can see we're moving towards the, seeing those traces because that's how the semi-definite program is, is formulated. With this additional constraint, so this is a linear constraint, all the nonlinearity gets wrapped up in this constraint that you know, here this W matrix is a rank one matrix. If you have you know, uh, X, X transpose, a vector has you know, one uh, vector of independence in that, inside that matrix. We, so if we have this constraint that W equals one, we've really not changed the problem. So up to, up to this point, no relaxation. Where the relaxation comes in is we say this, all the nonlinearities, all the difficulties in the problem are in this rank constraint. Let's get rid of it. Let's replace it instead by saying that W is positive semi-definite. So this matrix here is a rank one matrix that is positive semi-definite already. The relaxation enters when we say, neglect this constraint. Let's just enforce a, uh, a positive semi-definite constraint instead of a rank constraint. Then we solve what we now have as a semi-definite program so we can find the global optimum. And if the solution has the property that the rank of this matrix is equal to one, then we have a zero duality gap solution. We have a, a relaxation is tight and we've recovered the global solution. So that's something we couldn't have done with existing techniques. So I'm gonna give an example. So imagine we, we start with this vector X as, a, as previously and say we wanna form the voltage magnitude at um, at bus one. We want to form a, a constraint on that or an equation for that, that uh, variable. So we want to form, what we'll actually form is V1 squared, the magnitude of bus one squared. Well, we see here, how, do we, how can we form that? We, we need VD1 squared plus VQ1 squared. Just using the properties of imaginary or complex numbers, that's how we, we get uh, you know, voltage magnitude squared. So as I mentioned, this, this trace is kind of like a dot product. We see here that uh, if we put a one in this entry, we'll add a one times VD1 squared. If we put a one in this entry, we'll have a one times VQ1 squared. And our resulting, uh, this expression here, will give us V1 squared. 
we can define similar properties or similar equations for all the other powerful equations. This is just an example for the voltage magnitude. So this is exact right now. We haven't changed anything. What we then do is replace that rank one constraint with this positive semi-definite constraint on this matrix. And now we have a semi-definite relaxation of the problem. So how do we apply this to the optimal power flow problem? Here we see the classically formed optimal power flow problem. We're minimizing some cost function. Here it's a quadratic cost function of the generator powers. We're subject to engineering constraints. Here we're saying that our, our generators have to be within their maximum and minimum limits. You know, if we have a 100 megawatt uh, generator, it better not be set to operate at 200 megawatts. And here we're saying that our voltage magnitudes have to lie within some bounds. You know, we can't have really high or really low voltages. This is the constraint for the line flow equation, saying we better not melt our transmission lines. And here's our physical laws. Our optimization has to satisfy these power flow equations, the network equations. So we introduce this semi-definite relaxation to this problem. We can rewrite all the variables in terms, or all the, all the functions, just as I rewrote the voltage magnitude before, we can rewrite all the power injections, active and, and reactive power injections, in a similar form. So we substitute in this uh, matrix variable W, where, so now we have an optimization just over W. The relaxation comes in when we get rid of this XX transpose and make it so that instead of being a rank one matrix, we just say W is positive semi-definite. We're left with a semi-definite program that we can solve to global optimality. So as I mentioned, a so we, we say a, a solution is physically meaningful. In other words, the relaxation is tight if it has this zero duality gap. Those are all kind of synonyms. Uh, and this occurs if the resulting solution to this problem, to the semi-definite relaxation, has a you know, we don't enforce this constraint, but if it's true, then our relaxation is, you know, is tight. Yeah. Daniel, if you say the constraint is W, so it's not Certainly, this, if we constrain W to be XX transpose, um, it, it would be, it would be redundant. But we, right, we just completely drop that constraint. So if, the, if this W matrix is equal, can be written as an XX transpose, in other words, it's rank one, then we can recover the optimal solution from this semi-definite program. And our first contribution is in regards to some of the existing literature, which was overly optimistic on this point, where they claimed that practical systems operating at normal conditions will always satisfy this, this condition. In other words, all, the relaxation will always work. Uh, so what we showed is for some situations where we have negative Lagrange multipliers for active power, in other words, in a, an electricity market context, this would be cases where you have negative prices, um, which are uncommon. What that actually means is you're being paid to consume power, uh, but do occur. Uh, that situation can result in, in this relaxation being tight. And also, if you have uh, sufficiently tight line flow constraints, you, the, the relaxation runs into some problems. and we came up with a simple three bus system that, that shows this. So next, we want to extend this to larger systems. You know, we can run these small systems, and that's great, but uh, for it to be practical, we really need to be able to run this on large systems. So in order to do that, we had to make some advances in, in how we modeled these problems. We also had to make some computational improvements because this semi-definite optimization can be, can be slow for large problems. And we had to, uh, or we, what we wanted to do was come up with a, a sufficient condition for global optimality. So if we had a solution from a different method, could we test to see if that solution was in fact the global optimum? So first, some modeling advances. The first thing we had to do was model multiple generators at the same bus. So the existing formulations just limited the total power injection at a bus with neglecting any of the individual representations or individual characteristics of multiple generators existing at the same location. So you couldn't model something like this. Uh, but we came up with a formulation that allowed you to do that by enforcing a consistent price at this bus. Uh, next, we had to be able to handle uh, parallel lines in transformers. So the existing formulations, again, just said, let's limit the total power flowing from bus A to bus B. But maybe you have two or more lines between those buses with potentially different characteristics. We needed a way to handle this situation here. We had multiple parallel lines. So we came up with a way to do that, including uh, off-nominal voltage ratios and non-zero phase shifts, so things you see in practical systems. 
Next, we wanted to speed this problem up. So the main way that in power systems we, we deal with large problems is using the fact that power systems are sparse. So sparse means that most of the time, a bus isn't connected to every other bus. In other words, if I'm sitting in Madison, Wisconsin, maybe I'm connected to Milwaukee and Chicago, but I'm not connected directly to New York City. So we see here, uh, this is an admittance matrix for a Polish system model. We have openly available models for Poland for whatever reason. Um, and you can see here how sparse it is. This is uh, representing, you know, each dot here would be a, a transmission line. And you can see that m there's only 0.1% you know, of the possible combinations of transmission lines actually exist. So we need to use the sparsity in order to, to make these problems run for big, big systems. Now the, the computational bottleneck in our method in the semi-definite program is this positive semi-definite constraint. As the systems get larger and larger, we're constraining a bigger and bigger matrix to be positive semi-definite. That's what slows us down. Now, what the existing literature has done is replaced this large positive semi-definite constraint uh, matrix. There's a method you can use to break it up into many small matrices and constrain each of the small matrices to be positive semi-definite, and that kind of takes advantage of some of the sparsity. Uh, but the downside to that is you need equality constraints between these matrices. So there's a trade-off. Break it up into more matrices, you have to enforce terms that really refer to the same term in the big matrix to be equal. I'm going to show an example. So our original case, we just have this large 2n. If n is the number of buses in our system, we have this large 2n by 2n um, matrix, constrained to be positive semi-definite. As kind of a conceptual example in the existing literature, perhaps we can break it down into these three matrices, one, two, and three, and we constrain each of those to be positive semi-definite. The downside is we have to enforce these linking constraints between those terms that overlap. What we've proposed doing is a heuristic method that looks at these constraints and says, if there's a lot of overlapping constraints, perhaps we should just combine these back into one bigger matrix. And by doing that, we've been able to come up with a, a factor of two to three speed improvement over some of the existing uh, decompositions, existing techniques. The final, uh, con or, well, another contribution in this area is uh, th these existing methods for breaking up this big matrix into small matrices are great, but they don't actually tell you how to get a solution out. You know, it just tells you how to break it up. So that was kind of a gap in the existing, um, existing techniques. So we came up with a, a method for, for recovering that. So we applied this to some large systems. And what do we see? Uh, some solutions worked great. You know, the, the system had a zero duality gap. It was, the relaxation was tight. Everything, you know, we got a global solution where you couldn't have ever done that before. Uh, however, there were other, uh, other systems that did have non-zero duality gap. In other words, the relaxation wasn't tight. But the interesting thing is there was really only a few locations where there was problems. So if we looked at the, um, if we looked at the largest or the closest rank one matrix, we didn't have a rank one matrix, but we found the closest rank one matrix, and we plugged that back into the equations, we saw that there's really only a few locations for some of these systems where there was a, an, an error. So we're currently investigating this you know, right now to see what's going on at these few places and perhaps can we change something about them so that you know, this relaxation would work for these systems. Finally, we, uh, in this area we looked at a uh, sufficient condition for global optimality. So in other words, we had 40 years of developments in this field for trying to find solutions to these optimal power flow problems. It seemed a waste to throw all that away. So what we did is came up with a method to determine if a solution from some existing technique was indeed the global optimum. So we could use what are called the, the Kruskun tucker or KKT conditions for the optimization problem to determine if it would satisfy, uh, if it was a global solution. What we found is similar to the, the previous results. Many of the small systems, the existing methods do really well, uh, but for some large systems, we're still unable to tell. Next, I'd like to talk about some reliability issues. So what we did here was uh, developed a sufficient condition for power flow insolvability with applications to voltage stability margins. I'm going to describe these in a second. So the key point is the power flow equations might not have any solution. You know, these are nonlinear equations. Uh, nonlinear equations might, you can specify them that don't have a solution. So what that means is that there's no voltages, no voltage profile, voltage phasers on the network that give you the power injections that you specified. 
And where might we see these? Uh, particularly common in long range planning studies. So in other words, 20 years from now, we project that our loads have increased by, you know, however many percent, and perhaps now our existing system can't support those loads. We can also see these in uh, contingency studies. So in other words, what happens if we lose a transmission line, lose a major generating station? Now all of a sudden our system, which was adequate, might not be adequate anymore. What's difficult with existing methods is to guarantee that uh, the power flow equations are insolvable. You know, perhaps our, we have our locally convergent method uh, where we're dependent on initial guess. If we don't find a solution with our existing technique, maybe they, we just had a bad initial guess. Let's pick another one. Well, that one didn't work either. How do we, you know, there's uh, too many initial guesses that you can't try them all. Another thing we want is to be able to determine a distance to the solvability boundary. So in other words, say we're operating our system, how far away are we from a point where the power flow equations have no solution and we now have a blacked out New York City? So I'm gonna give an example from close to home where this was applicable. So here was a, a report from ATC, American Transmission Company, which uh, it runs or build, is in charge of the electric uh, transmission system in Wisconsin. So we see that the, the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin approved a vital addition to Dane County, which is where Madison is, uh, electric transmission system in June 2009. The key point is that the project will serve multiple reliability functions and involves constructing 32 miles of 345 kV transmission line, cost $219 million. Now I know some of the people who worked on this project and were involved in the planning for it. And I asked, how did you, you, know, how did you determine what are these multiple reliability functions for this line? They said, well, we looked at loads as they were increasing over the next you know, 10 years. We said, uh, when we try to solve these problems with the increased loads, our, our you know, method doesn't converge. I said, therefore, we, we, there's no solution. I said, no, there's not. There might still be a solution. You know, how do we know that there's no solution? It'd be nice if we had a guarantee. Now, perhaps there really is no solution, and this $219 million investment is, is a, you know, absolutely necessary, but perhaps there truly is a solution, and we spent $219 million of ratepayer money, uh, perhaps unnecessarily. So that's the, uh, the goal here, is to provide a, an answer to that question. So how do we determine, uh, how do we guarantee that the power flow equations are, have no solution? Uh, what we did is we came up with first an existence proof. So we said there is for sure a power flow solution if you allow me to raise my voltages up high enough. You know, if you allow me unlimited uh, upper limits on my voltage, you, I raise them up high enough, I can give a solution for any set of power injections. We have a, a proof of that under some technical conditions that are typically satisfied. What we then try to do is we say, okay, well, if we know there's a solution up here, can we find how low we can reduce the voltages while still having a solution? So what we do is set up an optimization problem where we try to minimize the voltage while still satisfying the power injection constraints. Well, that's a hard problem to do. We're still trying, you know, that's perhaps as hard as answering the original question. How do the power flow equations have a solution? But with this semi-definite relaxation, we get a lower bound. So this lower bound, uh, for a special optimization problem I'll define in a second, will tell us how low we could reduce our voltages. And if that lower bound is greater than what we specify the voltages to be, we have no solution, guaranteed. So perhaps to rephrase this, we say that the power injection equations are satisfied by some voltage profile, perhaps sufficient, very high. We ask the question, could any such voltage profile match what we specify our voltages to be? To check, we minimize the slack bus voltage with um, locking the PV bus voltage magnitudes proportionally, so we're kind of re up changing the whole voltage profile simultaneously, and we can use semi-definite optimization to get a lower bound on that value. So here's the optimization problem we're interested in. Let's try to minimize the slack bus voltage, subject to our active and reactive power injection constraints, where we've got this uh, relationship, we've locked the relationship between the PV and slack bus voltage. So all our generators are, are operating with their specified um, ratios in their voltages. But this problem is hard to solve. Perhaps as hard as our original problem. So what we do is we convert it to a semi-definite program. We say here, now we're writing everything in terms of this uh, positive semi-definite matrix, W. And we have our active and reactive power injections and our voltage magnitude constraints. This gives us a lower bound on the, on the slack bus voltage. Then we can say we have a necessary condition for solution existence. If this minimum slack bus voltage is less than our specified slack bus voltage, we might have a solution. 
Conversely, we can write the other way. We can say if this minimum slack bus voltage is greater than our specified voltage, we are guaranteed to not have a solution. So that's a sufficient condition for solution non-existence. The interesting thing here is there's no requirements on the rank of any of these matrices anymore. It's, uh, we're just using the fact that this function is a lower bound. So uh, that's, that's what uh, we really, we're, a lot of the power in this semi-definite relaxation is from the fact that we can get this lower bound even if the relaxation isn't tight. So now we'd like to answer this question, how far away are we from having a solution? So what we've come up with is what's called a power injection margin. So what we say is the, the powerful equations have this quadratic property. If we um, scale all of our power injections, so say you know, our optimization is some function of the power injections, this minimum slack bus voltage, then uh, do the quadratic proper nature of these equations. If we scale the power injections by this factor eta, this minimum slack bus voltage squared also scales by this factor eta. So what we do is we say, well, we, know we have a, a condition for insolvability. Let's scale this value until it just satisfies that condition. That occurs when uh, this uh, relationship here holds. So this corresponding value of eta gives us a margin to the power flow solvability boundary. It tells us by what factor could we increase all of our power injections while still possibly having a solution. So here's the way power engineers tend to think about this. We have a, here what's called a PV curve. We have a voltage at some bus and uh, the amount of power at, that we're increasing all of our injections, power injections by. As we increase the power injections further and further, our voltages can drop until eventually we hit a bifurcation point and we've lost our solution. This is blacked out New York City here. So what we would like to know is without calculating this curve, how far are we from, from this value, from this point? So in order to calculate that, we use the same semi-definite relaxation, plug it into you know, this relationship here, and we get that we could you know, have a, uh, a multiplier of a factor of roughly four. We see that's right there. We've identified the nose point of this PV curve without actually having to calculate all these intermediate solutions. Now it would be great if we always got it right on. But as this is a relaxation, we don't. So there's some cases we're here, we're looking at the IEEE standard 118 bus test case. And we see that this red line is where the power flow equations are guaranteed to be insolvable. This is our condition says beyond this red line, for sure no solutions. But we see this, this small gap here where there, we don't find any solutions. It looks like this curve has, has turned over and worked its way back but our insolvability condition isn't satisfied yet. So uh, as a sufficient condition, we can have this, this occur. And one of the things we're looking at right now is trying to determine why does this happen? You know, what, what, what properties of the system make it so that there can be this gap? And what uh, we're conjecturing is that it has to deal with uh, other solutions to powerful equations. So here, this is the, the high voltage stable solution. This is what we like to operate at. It's easy to find, we can trace it. But uh, in reality, there's a whole bunch of other equations to these nonlinear power flow solutions that live down here. In fact, uh, using um, an existing numerical method, we were able to find 814 solutions at this blue line. So what we conjecture is going on is that in these cases where there's a lot of solutions that are just you know, bifurcating or just terminating at around this same point, that's when we can get this gap. We're working on that now. Another thing we're interested in is looking at reactive power limits. So when we're modeling generators, uh, the, the previous work modeled them as just ideal voltage sources. They held a constant voltage regardless of how much reactive power they output. This isn't entirely you know, um, realistic, that real, real generators have upper and lower limits on their reactive power outputs. And we therefore have to enforce this characteristic here where when the reactive power limits are within, or when the reactive power injections are within their limits, the voltage is held fixed. But when they hit an upper limit, the voltages are allowed to decrease at the generator buses. It's this kind of switching behavior. This is known as limit-induced bifurcation, uh, is the kind of technical term for it, because when you hit enough limits, perhaps you no longer can satisfy conservation of energy and you lose a solution that way. We came up with two uh, approaches for modeling these limits, one using what's known as mixed integer semi-definite programming, so a more general form of this, of this uh, approach we used here. And uh, some more of the recent work we've done uses real algebraic geometry where we can use what's called sum of squares programming. And my favorite 
theorem name ever, the Pazestelenstaz or Pistaz theorem. I have a friend who speaks German, and I need to ask her how, a, how you actually pronounce that. But uh, the idea is we can use that, these things to identify when the powerful equations, including reactive power limits, have no solution. And we've done that for some small systems. Now I'd like to wrap up here with a brief conclusion. The inter increasing interconnectedness of electric power systems gives us both challenges and opportunities. Opportunities in improving power system economics, challenges in maintaining power system reliability. What we've specifically looked at is the semi-definite relaxation and applying it to the optimal power flow problem to determine the system dispatch, and this question of power flow insolvability and voltage stability margins. Many avenues for future work in this area. As I mentioned uh, briefly, we, we'd like to better understand when this relaxation is tight. We'd like to make further computational improvements, and we'd like to address some other problems, like the, the unit commitment problem, in other words, determining when should we turn on and off our generators. Now, the existing uh, techniques I've, I've discussed here, I've implemented in MATLAB code that integrates with the uh, power system software MATPower. It's an open source, freely available uh, toolbox. And we're preparing that to, to release that publicly soon. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention today, especially on this gorgeous afternoon, and welcome any questions. So, so that's what we're interested in finding out now, is when the, when the relaxation isn't tight, in other words, it, it's not giving a solution to the original problem. You know, uh, at, from one perspective, you know, perhaps that's the end of the road. Maybe this just doesn't work. From another perspective, the more optimistic perspective is to say, uh, as we, we saw previously, there's, in most of the cases we've seen where it doesn't work when the relaxation isn't tight, there's just a few problem areas. So what we've noticed is, you know, Perhaps there is one bus hanging off the system, one radio connection that's causing a, a large problem. If we can somehow change the modeling of that bus or somehow handle that specially, um, maybe we can still make some progress in these cases where the relaxation isn't tight. It's, it's, it's interesting because so there, there's some really small examples where the relaxation isn't tight for. If you take those small examples and stick them onto a bigger <coughs> system that is working, that big system will stop working. So, you can look at it from the glass half empty and say, for a big system, well, there's a lot of opportunities for these small pieces to be problematic. You can look at it from the other perspective and say, well, maybe for big systems, it's not a problem with the whole system, it's a problem with some isolated area. Follow up on that. Is it not possible somehow to analyze your constraints and partition your non convex space mm -hmm. into chunks of convex spaces the and solve them separately? Is there any work in this area at all? I've seen a paper, a preprint of a paper that does something similar to what you're, you're mentioning. It seems like a good idea. I don't know how much, you know, I, I'd, I'd be, I'm looking forward to seeing the final version of that paper because they left a lot out, but that's, yeah. I, Essentially, you did a very hard problem to identify sub regions of your search space which are convex. That's a good question. I don't know the answer, uh, but that's certainly something worthy of, I mean, because if you can identify which pieces are are convex, you can maybe apply these methods to each piece. And um, no, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. So I, I think the the, the most important thing is this global optimality. You know, with the existing methods, they're all local. You're not guaranteed of finding the true global solution. This is something we've looked for for 40 years. And to be close to the end of the road, potentially, is, is exciting. To be able to say, for this problem, which is solved every day by utilities and, and markets, you know, not just in the United States, but around the world, 
and to be able to truly say we've got the global solution to that. We're not going to improve on, you know, perhaps we can make improvements in other areas, but this piece of it is, is solved. That's, I think, pretty, to me, pretty exciting. Um, so me and, and the other, I mean, certainly there's people at Caltech and Berkeley and Columbia, other places working on uh, this idea. So I guess when I say we, I mean this broader community, yeah. And me. After all the calculations and fantastic mathematical ideas, how, I'm wondering how do you correlate your calculation to the reality? Um, clearly it's not easy to do an experiment to get experimental data mm -hmm. following your under your boundary conditions or would you be able to connect them? Sure, sure. So uh, that's one of the major challenges we have in power system research in general is, is coming up with uh, ways to validate our work because the uh, fine people at the utilities don't let us go out there and trip lines off. So in a lot of cases, what, what we need to do is use sort of natural experiments. You know, if, there's, if we have the measurements in the right places when there is a problem on the grid that we can you know, hopefully see if our models match that result. So it's, it's uh, particularly difficult in some of these cases. So I, sh I should back up a second. I'm talking about the reliability aspects now. Um, and it's particularly difficult in those cases because large-scale blackouts are, are relatively rare. You know, the, everyone talks about August 2003 because it was such a big deal, but also because it was you know, so, so rare. So having the data from these large-scale blackouts is challenging. It's certainly a challenge that, that faces our power system. In terms of the economic problem of optimizing the, um, the electricity markets or, or electric dispatch, uh, that's a problem that we can certainly compare against uh, the choice. It's a policy choice uh, that we make as to how to operate the grid. It's not, a, um, it's not quite as much as a physical limitation of, of the network. So if we can provably show what people are doing now, I, I think that's kind of an experimental validation of the Sure, so um, it's the problem we have is getting good models. A lot of the good models are limited by NDA agreements. You know, if we want, you know, the government is getting more and more strict as they limit the ability to obtain realistic models that are, that are truly large scale. Now, the, there's kind of standard test cases that, that people use. Uh, the ones that I've looked at here are 14 buses and 118. They're pretty small for the reliability stuff. One of the, for whatever reason, Poland has an openly available use that model, and that one is about 3,000 buses. So what we'd really like to be able to do is tens of thousands of buses. I think most of the, you know, the models of the Eastern interconnection, the biggest interconnection on the, on the Earth, are usually around 40,000. Where we'd like to. Be. Plus, as uh, two lines, uh, so it's, it's a little bit tough, but that gives you a sense of the. Uh, so, for the polish uh, system we were mentioning, this 3000 bus case, that run, we ha I have a desktop, you know, high end desktop computer that we've been using for simulations, and it takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, right, right. So the um, the idea for a lot of it is planning. Uh, you know, right. And that's how a lot of people you know handle real emergencies on the grid. You know, you, even with existing methods, it's very difficult to operate. You know, find a new solution in real time. So what people do a lot of times is come up with you know. A lookup table, a list of you know, if this ha occurs, do this action. If this occurs, do this action. So that's not uh, not out of the realm of how things are done currently. Um, Hopefully. Sure. So I, I think one of the 
uh, key pieces that, that can be beneficial in solving these problems faster is trying to take better advantage of parallelization. You know, it seems like I, I'm not an uh, expert in you know, the chip architecture and that sort of thing, but it seems like moving more and more towards multiple core and GPU computing and this sort of thing, which really requires you to be able to parallelize your problems. And uh, so that's another thing we're kind of thinking about now is how do you uh, break this problem down into, into pieces that can be easily computed on in, in smaller chunks? Um, so, I, I, I know a few of the people that work at some of the ISOs and, and look at the way that they, they handle these situations, and it's really through a lot of simulations, you know, it's a lot of um, background knowledge that, you know, they just really understand the system, you know, what, what sort of contingencies do we need to worry about? But I think the, the point you're getting at is that there's a huge number of possible contingencies, you know, there's, uh, you know, if there's 40,000 lines, there's 40,000 potential loss of one line contingencies and when you start increasing the number of, you know, if two lines can go down at once, now you increase combinatorically the number of, of possible um, contingencies that you need to analyze. So the way things handle or ha happen now are, you know, somebody with a lot of knowledge of the system. But uh, that's another area that, so I haven't specifically addressed in this talk, but is certainly deserving of future research where, you know, can we look at different ways to break up this huge possible contingencies down the challenges with that, I mean people look at things like cascade line or one generator, how does that affect other, you know, can we lose other things that you know, uh, ways of, of handling that problem. But none of them are achieved of anything, you know, so It's certainly an area for future research. I haven't done a lot of thought on that myself. Increase the contingency factor. So it's a very valid. Thing. Um, so right now, the, we haven't extended the modeling of the problem to handle DC links, and I know that other, there's some people in, um, in Sweden that are working on that right now. Um, I've seen a, an early person in Sweden that's been doing that. And I think that has a lot of uh, potential because, you know, the in introducing increasing amounts of power electronics gives us more flexibility in how we operate the system. Um, also gives us more failure points, you know, so there's, there's trade-offs there as well. Certainly Paul I tried to do and this sort of work. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so the way a lot of this, this works is, uh, especially out east, is that uh, you have many utilities that all are under one market structure. So that ISO is doing the, dis the independent system operator, ISO is doing the dispatch for you know, all of these utilities that it's under its umbrella. And all the utilities agree to the rules as to how these markets operate. And you know, I ideally, you have a, something that's meeting some sort of social optimum. Um, now, if you... It's, it's almost, yes, certainly you're, you're asking almost more of a policy question. Here, so how do you, um, right, right. So, right, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting question as to how different, it, it's one of these public good problems. You know, you have many utilities having a shared infrastructure that everyone has a, uh, a responsibility to treat, you know, appropriately. No one should be out there trying to, damage the network or acting irresponsibly, but you know, these 
companies are in financial competition with one another, so there's potential market power and other issues like that. So I think there's uh, a role for, in, in at least the way they handle this, is a strong you know, market uh, operator that's handling large regions so you don't have these boundary conditions as much. Um, and I think in other places you need to have you know, strong regulatory authority to make sure that companies aren't abusing their, their shared responsibility of the, of the network. Right, right, and that's um, that's a very good point. It, this is, you know, this reliability issue is kind of a, um, you know, a worst case sort of thing. You know, that you know, um, but certainly you start introducing problems well before that that point. So there's uh, another problem that we've been been looking at uh, that's not quite, but. Uh, the question of trying to find all the solutions to these powerful equations. So these unstable equilibrium points, if you could identify where they all are, you could say how far away are you from them. So that's um, uh, an unsolved problem or an open question for, power, for the powerful equations. You know, is there a computationally tractable way to identify all the solutions so that you can stay away from these unstable ones? That's something else we've, we've looked at a little bit. Uh, turns out it's really hard. Ha, 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 ha.